joint pains uh, is a common presentation. A child presenting with a joint pain is a common presentation, mostly in uh, emergency departments. Uh, it may be a uh, it may be a problem with the joint, or it may be something related to the joint. Uh, for example, child having arthritis, or child having uh, slipped capital femoral epiphysis, may have a pain, or child may have a referred pain in a joint, but having the pathology elsewhere. Uh, so in this lecture, uh, the presentation is mainly focused on the joint pains or arthritis, and not on other conditions which may mimic a joint pain. So uh, joint pains uh, are common, and it affects uh, up to ten to twenty percent of school age children. However, uh, the differential diagnosis is broad. Some conditions, uh, some underlying etiologies for the joint pain, are not so serious. Whereas the other can be a life-threatening cause, something like septic arthritis, or it can be something which can have a, a poorer prognosis. For example, a child presenting with a malignancy, leukemia, uh, can present with joint pains, or sometimes. Child having systemic concept JIA can present with a joint pain, so um, it can be challenging. And also, it's important to realize that, uh, like I said, not all the joint pains and limb pains are not due to arthritis. It can be something else. And although the term such as arthritis always implies a painful joint, sometimes the joint may not be painful. For example. Uh, so let's move on to definition. So definition. So pain may not pain should need need not to be the always for you to recognize arthritis. Right. So let's look at what arthritis is. So a child presenting with arthritis is always a diagnostic challenge, uh, even for the experienced clinician, because the underlying etiology is not straightforward in most occasions. And investigations do little to the diagnosis. It's mainly the clinical approach, your history and the physical examination that help the narrow that help you narrow down the differential diagnosis. And it's defined as either a swollen joint. So if your joint is swollen, then that is a so solid evidence that the child is likely having arthritis. But sometimes your joint is not swollen. Then there need to be at least two of. Two of limited range of movement, pain on movement, or warmth overlying the joint. So even if you don't have a swollen joint, if you have limited range of movement or functional limitation, plus some warmth, constitute an arthritis, which is not arthritis, arthritis, right? Right. So differential diagnosis, like I said, is broad. Right. So simply, uh, you can categorize them uh, depending on whether it's single joint involvement or a multiple joint involvement. And then, depending on whether you have fever and with no fever. And if you look at uh, a child presenting with single joint involvement with fever. The differential diagnosis, the common kind of uh, more serious ones include septic arthritis, something we should never forget because it can lead to destruction of the joint if the timely antibiotics plus or minus drainage of pus is not performed. Right. So septic arthritis, single joint with fever. Similarly, reactive arthritis. It can sometimes be more than more than one joint as well, but sometimes you can just present with a limp having a uh, hip arthritis uh, with some fever and osteomyelitis osteomyelitis jia in the oligoarticular variant the child can just present with one one joint involvement or sometimes bone tumor and rare disease like sarcoidosis and sometimes traumatic arthritis can present with fever or tb right? so those are single joint with fever and single joint without fever uh, mostly due to hemoarthrosis or trauma and acute bleeding into a joint 
and avascular necrosis of the joint and if it's the spine then discitis mechanical pain psychogenic pain where there is no fever right or a hemoglobin apathy something like uh, thalassemia intermedia or sickle cell presenting with arthritis and multiple joint involvement again it can be with fever without fever so multiple joint can be reactive arthritis there can be hip and knee arthritis on one side with fever <laughs> or viral infection now sometimes dengue fever it doesn't cause joint swelling but sometimes there can be some warmth and uh, pain which constitute arthritis or oh, so dengue dengue or viral arthritis it can be a uh, systemic concept jia polyarticular jia and certain vasculitic disorders can present with multiple joints and with fever and inflammatory bowel disease yeah so those are uh, the instances where multiple joints affected with fever and without fever multiple joints can get involved in uh, enthesitis related arthritis and connective tissue disorders like dermatomyositis and following vaccination sometimes you can have multiple like you can sometimes develop serum sickness and arthritis and joint hypermobility in conditions like marfan syndrome where there is joint hypermobility patient can easily feel pain and some functional limitation and malignancy so sometimes malignancy can be a single joint or sometimes can be multiple joint arthritis right so those are uh, like you can broadly categorize arthritis depending on whether there is single joint or multiple joint involvement and with fever and without fever uh, so important thing so arthritis or arthritis like symptoms can be the presentation of leukemia or tuberculosis so we have to be very careful uh, before you label something uh, you know a, a condition like with a like a more uh, benign benign diagnosis like reactive arthritis a child may have so it's important that we perform a careful evaluation of such a child and also uh, many rheumatological conditions can have extra articular manifestations i mean beyond beyond the um uh joint uh, system for example uh, a child or or a teenager presenting with systemic lupus erythematosus can have multiple joint involvement arthritis or arthralgia and they have other common comorbidities including pulmonary renal uh, skin manifestations skin rash cardiac endocarditis and eye manifestations so so it so arthral arthralgia so it's important to look for other systemic involvement as well that can give a clue to the diagnosis and then certain uh, conditions where the presentation is arthritis can have serious con- consequences uh, unless you attend on time for example uh, septic arthritis so you need to diagnose it without delay and give iv antibiotics plus or minus arrange ultrasound guided drainage of pus or open arthrotomy unless a child can lose the joint and similarly systemic onset jia can lead to complications unless timely treatment is not given so it's very important for certain conditions to uh, to make the diagnosis early to prevent early and severe complications um however uh, it it can be difficult as well you know in many rheumatological cases for example uh, or a child presenting with dermatomyositis or sle or, or kind of a vasculitic syndrome it may not be possible to make a diagnosis on the very first visit the patient is coming to see you so you you might need follow up and starting from uh, basic investigations to more advanced and specific investigations to arrive at the diagnosis so so it so it's important in this way it we need to understand there are certain instances where you have to 
you have to diagnose certain uh, conditions very early sometimes you have to identify uh, certain serious conditions as well as uh, in the other occasions to diagnose benign conditions and then offer reassurance appropriately so it is often challenging to the uh, general practitioner or the doctor or to the pediatricians even to the senior senior clinician it can be challenging because of this uh, numerous presentations uh, and uh, the pattern and the presentation and the duration of arthritis are helpful in differentiating various possible diagnosis so which i will discuss in the coming time and the differential diagnosis is often very broad therefore the key to diagnosis is uh, like doing a, a comprehensive history taking and to perform a, a detailed uh, clinical examination and in most of these conditions lab investigations help a little lab investigations help a little it's it's the clinical clinical assessment that help you to narrow down the differential diagnosis and subsequently the investigations might help you limited investigations might help you to make the final diagnosis so history and physical examination is very important so let's look at how we can approach to a child uh, with joint pains right so history taking so let's let's move on history taking um, so it's important to ask about the demographic factors whether the child is a girl or a boy the age of the child and where they live are they living and how the how the disease evolved over time whether it's a single joint uh, whether there was fever whether there were some systemic symptoms and how it progressed with uh, over time whether there were multiple joint involvement whether there were like a migratory pattern of involvement or whether there is intermittent pattern so knowing the disease chronology is very important so that it will give you some clues to arrive at the final diagnosis and also when a child presenting with arthritis assess the inflammatory nature now to differentiate inflammatory versus mechanical inflammatory pain often uh, results when you you know rest your joint for example arthritis due to uh, inflammatory or rheumatoid arthritis uh, your pain is severe in the morning with stiffness so that stiffness worsens with rest whereas mechanical pain uh, worsens with movement the more you use the joint the pain will be more in mechanical uh, arthritis whereas uh, in the inflammatory arthritis the pain actually is worse at the time the joint is rested and then identify the progression uh, reactive arthritis likely to resolve with time whereas uh, arthritis due to uh, malignancy can persist and present with complications <clears throat> and then assess the distribution of the joint involvement whether it's peripheral joints central joints or central or peripheral joints both or whether there is axial joint or temporomandibular joint so assess the pattern of joint involvement which will help you in uh, narrowing down the diagnosis and also look for extra articular manifestations which are the systemic symptoms whether the child is losing weight whether the child is losing appetite whether there is kidney involvement liver involvement eye involvement so likewise so it's important to uh, obtain uh, those information from a child presenting with arthritis so if you look at the age of the child sometimes it helps in arriving at the diagnosis right so reactive arthritis which is the combined condition reactive arthritis occurs after a viral infection or upper respiratory tract infection and after a few days the child presents with knee joint pain or hip joint pain and child can present with a limp so that usually happens in a toddler or a preschooler so likewise so early childhood the common conditions are kawasaki disease you may have seen kawasaki disease is more common in children uh, like age from 3 to 6 years or so it can be seen even in younger children and uh, rheumatoid factor negative arthritis is seen in early childhood whereas rheumatoid factor positive polyarticular GI is seen usually after uh, 10 years old and hsp again seen in early childhood 
and in mid childhood certain conditions are more common things like juvenile dermatomyositis polyarthritis nodosa so vasculitic conditions psoriatic arthritis so they present some much later than other conditions and quite late like conditions like en- enthesitis related arthritis and sle usually in a teenager right so so age knowing the exact age can sometimes be helpful and if you look at the sex the gender of the child certain conditions are more common but it doesn't mean like it cannot happen in the opposite sex but uh, uh, in certain conditions there is a gender or sex predisposition so sle polyarticular jia seen more commonly uh, they are seen more commonly in girls whereas uh, vasculitis like kawasaki disease is seen more commonly in boys and also uh where there is condyloarthropathy inflammatory bowel disease enthesitis related arthritis again seen more commonly in boys right uh and systemic onset jia where there is joint pain and high fever the fever pattern is classically described as quotidian fever daily fever so that is seen more commonly in both sexes so there's no predilection for a particular sex and the onset of the disease and the duration now septic arthritis if you have seen they present with high fever and excruciating very severe pain in one joint usually with extreme difficulty in movement of that affected joint so it's quite dramatic acute onset and also kawasaki disease children present with high fever with other criteria again it's quite acute in nature so as an action line uh, perpura whereas a child with uh, polyarticular jia can present with some indolent arthritis there may not be fever and it can go on for few weeks so it so its onset or the tempo of onset is quite insidious or less acute and uh, polyarthritis uh, uh less than 6 weeks uh polyarthritis can be seen uh in viral arthritis rheumatic fever or certain sometimes reactive arthritis uh when they have the duration less than 6 weeks and if the duration is more than 6 weeks then you have to of course suspect uh juvenile idiopathic arthritis so identifying the onset onset of the disease is uh, very important and then um, uh, assess whether there is pain or stiffness and then the character of the pain so if there is morning stiffness morning stiffness it is seen more commonly with inflammatory arthritis so inflammatory arthritis can be due to uh, juvenile idiopathic arthritis as well as certain other inflammatory types of arthritis as well and when you have arthritis with pain quite severe at the night time night pain bone pain that occurs at night time then you need to suspect whether there is a bone tumor or a hematological malignancy so that's quite characteristic of a hematological malignancy when you have night time joint pains and and if and see whether there is stiffness joint stiffness or stiff joints with functional um, movement limitation and if so assess the site and the number of joints severity the frequency duration the pattern and uh, whether there is any warmth or change in colors associated right so assessing the character of the pain and the stiff stiffness is again in this way uh, is helpful and there are some red flags uh, red flags of a child presenting with arthritis uh, now a child presenting with reactive arthritis they present after viral infection a respiratory tract infection with a limp but it is just that and there is some functional limitation but child doesn't have any other symptoms or no red flags okay. whereas if a child having if a child is having fever and systemic up, up, uh, upset including weight loss 
uh, reduced appetite, sweating. Then these may indicate an underlying connective tissue disorder like SLE, or it can in indicate an underlying hematological malignancy, or systemic onset GIA or GIA, a chronic inflammation. Right? So it uh, it is a red flag of a child presenting with arthritis. And uh, joint pain presenting with fever. However, reactive arthritis can present with fever. Uh, a child, any child with fever having joint pain, you have to make a thorough assessment. You have to do a thorough assessment because joint pain and fever can be due to uh, septic arthritis. So that's why, that's why it is listed as a red flag. And refractory or unremitting pain and persistent night waking. So night time waking due to pain, joint pain can indicate a hematological or a bone tumor, bone, malig or bone or hematological malignancy. And incongruence between the history and the uh, child's clinical presentation or the physical presentation is again a red flag, especially in pediatrics, because this can be uh, uh, due to non-accidental injury, a child presenting with a non-accidental fracture. So if that can be also child, the parents might say the child is having arthritis, but actually there can be a non-accidental fracture. So you have to be again careful if there is an, an incongruence between history and physical findings, then you have to suspect non-accidental injury. So these features are considered as uh, red flags, red flags of uh, arthritis. And in, uh, take a thorough systemic inquiry, ask about the fever and then assess the nature of the fever. Quotidian fever, the daily fever can be seen in patients with um, systemic onset JIA. Tuberculosis can have ongoing fever or pyrexia of unknown origin associated with systemic upset. And SLE can present with under undiagnosed fever. And hematological malignancy can present with undiagnosed fever. Osteomyelitis can present with undiagnosed and pyrexia of unknown origin. So all these diagnoses diagnosis can can present with fever, with with no clear etiology, and with joint pain. And ask about constitutional symptoms, weight loss, loss of appetite, night sweats and ask about specifically the night pain and take a good other systems inquiry especially uh, in uh, vasculitic conditions SLE there can be renal involvement neurological involvement cardiac involvement so it's important to ask about this cardiac symptoms liver symptoms kidney symptoms for example asking about hematuria mm, and urine output and so on. So it's very important, right? So extra articular features. Diarrhea can be there if the child is having inflammatory bowel disease, urethral discharge if it's due to Reiter's disease, ocular symptoms can be there if it's due to oligoarticular JIA, and rash can be seen in a number of conditions, including SLE and vasculitis, presence of hematuria, proteinuria, and presence of headache, convulsions so all of them are important <laughs> and also ask about precipitating factors <laughs> if it's a bleeding into joint the child may have a bleeding diathesis or trauma history and infections sometimes a recent history of streptococcus infection can lead to post streptococcal uh, arthritis or enteric fever can lead to arthritis or viral fever can lead to um, arthralgia and arthritis or post viral arthritis and ask about immunizations as well after certain immunizations uh, you develop serum sickness of which joint uh, uh, joint symptoms are representation mm -hmm. and drug exposure and exposure to tuberculosis so all of them <clears throat> can act as the precipitating event and then in the family history or the past history, ask about presence of bleeding disorders, hemophilia, uh, and uh, presence of 
HLA B27 positive diseases, which which can uh, be familial, <clears throat> for example, conditions like inflammatory bowel disease, uh, anterior uveitis, which is a feature mainly of oligoarticular JIA, psoriasis, ankylosing spondylitis, which uh, is associated with enthesis related arthritis. So ask about family and personal history. And then let's move on to the physical examination of joints. Uh, one of the important uh, important uh, uh, things about physical examination is to determine whether there is articular involvement or non-articular. The pain is articular pain or non-articular pain. Right? So arthritis, most of the time, which the pain is articular. So we have to know what articular structures and what non-articular structures are. So articular structures, essentially within the joint capsule, um, include synovium, synovial fluid, and the articular cartilage, intra-articular ligaments, joint capsule, and juxta-articular bone. Those structures are articular structures. Whereas non-articular structures include ligaments, tendons, bursas, muscles, fascia, bone, nerve, overlying skin. Right. So depending on that, your course may be different. If it's a non-articular structure involvement, for example, uh, uh, if it's tendinitis or inflammation of the ligament or bursa, then the patient, what is put in red, the patient will have point tenderness. It's not, it's not the whole joint, it's just a single point, some point over the surface of the joint is, uh, is tender. And also pain will not be there at rest, but pain will be there only during active movement. So those two features help uh, in identifying non-articular pain. Whereas articular, articular disorders uh, are characterized by pain, swelling, the, the signs of joint inflammation, pain, swelling, joint line tenderness, and limitation of active and passive movements. Right? So, know how to differentiate articular from non-articular pain and then this table shows the pattern of clinical presentation the joint involvement symmetry axial involvement and upper and lower in lower limb involvement in certain uh, arthritic arthritic conditions so if you take viral arthritis and reactive arthritis the presentation is often acute whereas Polyarticular JIA, enthesitis related arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, SLE, the clinical presentation is often chronic. And if you look at the pattern of involvement, uh, viral arthritis mainly affects the small joints, right? And enthesitis related arthritis, reactive arthritis, they have their pain often limited. Uh, confined to a large joint. For example, reactive arthritis, you have pain in hip joint or knee joint. Whereas in, in other conditions, SLE, psoriatic arthritis, polyarticular JIA, you can have large joints as well as small joints. Okay? So this is the common pattern. It's not 100% accurate, but this is a common pattern. And if you look at the symmetry of involvement, viral arthritis, mostly symmetry, Symmetrical, SLE again symmetrical, uh, and others asymmetrical often one side, one joint. Reactive arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, enthesitis related arthritis, often right or left side one, one joint, or uh, like there is asymmetry in such conditions. And axial involvement, <laughs> axial, sacroiliac or the spine involvement, spondylitis, some spondyloarthropathy. So you see that in enthesitis related arthritis and in some forms of psoriatic arthritis, but in others, viral arthritis, polyarticular JIA, uh, SLE, reactive arthritis, it's commonly not seen, commonly. And then upper or lower limb involvement. So lower limbs are predominantly involved in enthesitis related arthritis and reactive arthritis. Whereas in other conditions, you can have either upper or lower limb involvement. Right, and then uh, from uh, the the physical examination, determine whether it's inflammatory or non-inflammatory. So, inflammatory can be due to immune-mediated phenomena or infective. 
an inflammatory is uh, uh, characterized by morning stiff stiffness and jelling jelling is the pain that occurs after a period of inactivity and diffuse joint swelling and tenderness and often this inflammatory uh, arthritis they can have other systemic manifestations including weight loss loss of appetite and other other system involvement as well as the crp the inflammatory markers are often elevated whereas non inflammatory or the mechanical pain uh, they do not have any uh, significantly positive lab findings the isr crp blood pictures they are likely to be normal and the pain uh, occurs during physical activity so with uh, with activity or the pain is made worse and improves with rest or use of a uh, non uh, anti inflammatory agent not sorry non non inflammatory agent right and then um uh determining acute or chronic so acute the bleeding of knockers uh secondary to trauma bleeding conditions or acute arthritis due to infections rheumatic fever uh and so on or mechanical pain whereas chronic arthritis which is defined as joint pains going on for a period of more than 6 weeks is seen with certain chronic infections like tb and juvenile idiopathic arthritis right and then again examine to find out how many joints are affected uh in it can be single joint now we know what the common diagnosis are if it's a single joint it can be less than 5 joints which is called oligoarticular or more than five joints which can be polyarticular right so in juvenile idiopathic arthritis you can see mono oligo or polyarthritis and acute monoarthritis single joint the common diagnosis include infective courses like tuberculosis reactive arthritis uh first like initial period of juvenile idiopathic arthritis hematological malignancy trauma to a joint or mechanical damage to a joint so commonly present with acute monoarthritis chronic monoarthritis so chronic monoarthritis due to tb so usually a single joint and lasts for longer than 6 weeks and acute polyarthritis acute polyarthritis there can be multiple joint involvement uh rheumatic fever so there can be migratory type multiple joint involvement but it's usually short low short lasting rheumatic fever viral arthritis infective endocarditis so there can be uh, multiple joint involvement but the disease pattern is short like you know this is uh, duration is usually the pattern of joint involvement is shorter and chronic polyarthritis can uh, be mechanical uh, metabolic vasculitic and uh juvenile idiopathic arthritis right and then examine to find out whether there is any axial involvement axial means uh, the joints that you see on the spine sacroiliac sternoclavicular or menabrial sternal involvement right so the axial involvement seen commonly with enthesitis related arthritis and not usually seen with other types of arthritis rarely it can be seen with systemic diseases including jia where you can have sacroiliac and also in uh, sle and uh, peripheral arth joint involved or root joints root means the overlap between the axial and the peripheral joint right for example shoulder and the hip joint involvement right <laughs> right and then there are few other patterns uh, migratory involvement so you all know migratory uh, arthritis occurs typically in rheumatic fever and additive so starting from monoarthritis progressing to involve oligo to polyarthritis seen in typically polyarticular jia and intermittent arthritis is seen in some conditions for example in hemophilia you can have intermittent like hemoarthrosis sickle cell anemia you can see sickle cell arthritis sle you can have so intermittent right so 
different patterns of joint involvement help you uh, identify uh, the common differentials. And then assess whether there is symmetric or asymmetric involvement. So symmetrical uh, uh, joint involvement usually seen with polyarticular JIA, for example, small interphalangeal joints of both hands, or SLE, viral arthritis, so there is symmetric involvement. Whereas asymmetric involvement can be seen in oligoarticular JIA, psoriatic arthritis, reactive arthritis, septic arthritis, often single joint and asymmetric, right? And the other joint involvement, distal interphalangeal joints, can be involved in psoriatic arthritis, polyarticular JIA. Then temporomandibular joint can be involved in rheumatic factor negative polyarthritis. Knee and ankle joint involved with no other systemic manifestations, presenting with a limp, can indicate reactive arthritis. So, so the, identifying the pattern, axial involvement, symmetric, asymmetric, the number of joints, right? So they are helpfully narrowing down the differential diagnosis right and the other thing is to assess now this is not at the initial stage but looking back uh, uh, about how the child's presentation has evolved and whether they are deforming joints or non-deforming right so joint deformities are seen with long-standing and aggressive variants of rheumatic factor positive polyarticular JIA. Right. So it, it happens with delayed treatment or some uh, like inadequate treatment. So the, the, the patient can end up having deformities. Whereas most of the pediatric arthritis, arthritic conditions are non-deformic. So the three causes can be IBD, SLE, hematological malignancy, reactive arthritis, and so on. Right. So identify whether there is deforming or non-deforming arthritis. Right. And then uh, find out whether there are any associated enthesitis. Enthesitis is the inflammation of the uh, uh, inflammation at the attachment of tendons, ligaments, fascia and joint capsule. So that type of inflammation is called enthesitis related arthritis. Right. So that help uh, uh, you narrow down the uh, differential diagnosis and di diagnosing a condition like an exercise related arthritis. Right. And then identifying the fever and the pattern of fever. Now, uh, children with septic arthritis, Kawasaki disease, they are often very ill. Septic arthritis, high fever, 103, 4, and excruciating pain with severe limitation of the moment. So, high fever help you diagnose. And fever, and also in Kawasaki, you have very high fever, which is not responding until the child is given treatment, immunoglobulins. Uh, so in such conditions, the fever pattern is helpful. And there are other conditions like uh, lymphoma can present with joint pains and pale lips dying type of fever. And systemic constant JIA can present with fever, which is called quotidian or daily fever. Right. And then uh, general examination, you can see uh, the rashes, the type of rash, whether it's a malaria rash, whether it's a discoid rash, whether it's a vasculitic, purpuric, blanching, non-blanching rash, or identifying the pattern and the characteristic of the rash is helpful. And presence of palpable purpura, it's seen in Henoxian line purpura. Skin peeling, skin thickening, conjunctivitis, iritis, nail pitting, in psoriatic arthritis, pigmentation, presence of psoriatic skin lesions, mouth ulcers in SLE, and presence of organomegaly, hepatosplenomegaly in SLE, and presence of lymphadenopathy in hematological malignancy and SLE. Right? So, uh, general examination is also again helpful. Right. And there are some important extra-articular signs which we can look for and which can be seen in uh, certain types of uh, connective disorders as well as systemic disorders. Now, eye signs, eye signs can be seen in uh, journal idiopathic arthritis, the child may have uveitis, uveitis 
or non oxidative conjunctivitis and uh, examining the oral cavity in children with sle can have oral ulcers or strawberry tongue can be seen in a child with kawasaki or a cracked lip and skin various types of rashes malar rash discoid rash macular rash heliotrop rash is seen in dermatomyositis gotron papules again in dermatomyositis and palpable purpura in hsp edema of the hands and feet in the acute stage of kawasaki erythema nodosum seen in tuberculosis arthritis leg galsus are seen in sickle cell arthritis and renaud's phenomenon in vasculitis so in in that way the various various uh, uh, types of skin phenomena helpful in identifying the underlying disorder and nail and hair changes uh, hair loss alopecia is seen in sle nail pitting onycholysis seen with psoriasis and clubbing can be seen in ibd and musculoskeletal the the muscle weakness proximal muscle weakness or muscle tenderness can be seen in dermatomyositis <clears throat> so the pictures show uh, the child on uh, the hands show evidence of uh, nail pitting and onycholysis and this child uh having a butterfly skin rash and some mouth ulcers and evidence of uveitis in the eye and uh lymphatic system lymph node enlargement can be seen in uh, children with sle jia especially uh, systemic onset jia and renal system involvement presence of hematuria high blood pressure uh, is seen with sle and then nervous system uh, findings like seizure stroke psychosis they are seen uh, in certain uh, types of rheumatic fever sle vasculitis right yeah so so likewise there are various specific physical findings that uh, give uh, you a clue about the underlying diagnosis and then uh, the important part is joint examination which is called pgals or the pediatric gait arm leg spine right so first of all you ask three questions of the child whether there is any pain or stiffness in the joint difficulty in dressing dressing oneself or difficulty in going up and down stairs so that gives you a good overview about the functional limitation and then you sequentially examine the child's gait and then movements of the arm movements of the leg and movements of the spine to identify the functional limitation right so that is the main uh, examination that you have to perform to assess the joint involvement the pattern of joint involvement and the number of joint involvement literally you assess every joint of the body uh, when you do the pgals examination so that is very important in a, any child with in any child with arthritis right so that is the clinical assessment which include the history taking and examination and that gives you over 95% of information to arrive at the final diagnosis so investigations contribute to only 5% of uh, only only 5% in making a final diagnosis therefore they are not very very useful therefore in any child with arthritis what is more important is to take a thorough history thorough physical examination and then to do the limited essential investigations to arrive at the final diagnosis we should not do an exhaustive list of investigations without doing a proper clinical assessment in a child presenting with arthritis correct so most of the lab tests lab tests cannot confirm the diagnosis and also uh, absence of a particular disease mark this is marker does not exclude the diagnosis as well right uh so we had to keep that in mind and then plan the investigations appropriately certain useful investigations uh now if a child present with arthritis arthritis there are some important basic investigations we have to do uh for example we had to do a full blood count and a blood picture because that's the way that you can suspect uh, a hematological malignancy which can guide you to do a bone marrow aspiration and a biopsy so full blood count and blood picture the useful findings include uh, anemia anemia can be due to chronic disease uh, especially in inflammatory conditions like jia or 
uh, anemia can be due to SLE or anemia can be due to hematological malignancy. And white cells leukocytosis is seen with active arthritis, leukocytosis with abnormal cells again seen with hematological malignancy and leukopenia can be seen with SLE malignancy. Plated count, uh, often the plated count is increased in inflammatory arthritis and plated count can be decreased in connective tissue disorders, hematological malignancy and SLE. So full blood count and blood picture is one of the basic tests in any child presenting with arthritis. And these are the information that they are likely to provide. And again, we always do CRP and ESR in child presenting with arthritis. ESR, uh, it suggests inflammatory disease uh, and it's likely normal in mechanical problems. And if it's high, if it's very high, then that indicates underlying uh, probably probably an underlying systemic onset JIA, tuberculosis arthritis uh, or vasculitic condition or a hematological malignancy. If it's normal then it can be a mechanical or reactive arthritis. And C-reactive protein it's an acute marker of inflama uh, inflammation which is useful in conditions like septic arthritis your CRP is going to be very high. Right? Whereas CRP is likely to be normal in a condition like SLE or hematological malignancy. So to identify bacterial infection of a joint, stemyelitis or uh, uh, septic arthritis, doing CRP is important. So full blood count, CRP, full uh, blood picture and ESR are basic investigations that you have to consider doing in a child presenting with arthritis right and depending on the clinical uh, indication you can consider doing uh, biochemi biochemical test as well as urinary urine test testing for example if the child is having features of a vasculitic syndrome or sle or if you suspect serum sickness which can follow immunization then they are likely to show, show evidence of nephritis. So you can do urine for red cells, dysmorphic red cells, protein, and so on. And liver functions uh, can be non-specifically elevated in conditions like juvenile idiopathic arthritis, drug toxicity, uh, and with certain complications of uh, systemic onset GIA like macrophage activation syndrome. Right. And serology or the autoantibodies, uh, we should not be doing these antibodies in every child unless the clinical uh, uh, evidence support. Right. So it's they are helpful for the diagnosis of various autoimmune diseases, including SLE, JIA, uh, and uh, so on. And also they are helpful for monitor the disease activity. You can do the DSNA, DSDNA T test to identify the disease activity of SLE. And you can do the rheumatoid factor T test and so on. And also they are useful, useful for screening. You can do ANA testing and various other antibody testing to screen, screen uh, for that. So rheumatoid factor can be typically associated with polyarticular GIE rheumatoid factor, uh, positive variant. So prognostically, presence of rheumatoid factor there indicates uh, an erosive, more invasive disease. And ANA, uh, it can be present in 10% of normal population as well, but it is usually positive in SLE, oligoarticular JIA, and certain other connective tissue, tissue disorders. And DS DNA is specific, about 95% specific for SLE. So, uh, serological testing can be useful in uh, certain uh, arthritic conditions. Right, imaging. So again, we should not do imaging in each and every child presenting with arthritis, right? Uh, X-ray is a helpful in first line investigation, first line radiological investigation. Uh, it can show widening of the joint space, indicative of an effusion, or joint space narrowing with erosions in GIA. And if it's perthes, uh, you can uh, see the avascular necrosis of the hip, and ultrasound, ultrasound is 
mainly indicated in children with septic arthritis to identify effusion or synovitis and that can help you differentiate septic arthritis from other uh, conditions like reactive arthritis by the presence or absence and the degree of presence of synovial uh, effusion and also ultrasound is helpful for doing diagnostic aspiration as well as therapeutic aspirations as well as injecting certain drugs to the joints for example in uh, juvenile idiopathic arthritis uh, if it's monoarthritis then there is a place for injecting certain drugs to the joint including steroids and uh, with soft tissue uh, in to assess the soft tissues better for example in osteomyelitis there is a place for doing uh, investigations like mri which 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 give you a very good Uh, idea about the extent of involvement of the bone in osteo osteomyelitis right so to put uh, things uh, simply this flow chart shows what you need to do right uh, uh, in a child presenting with uh, undifferentiated atraumatic limb pain which can be arthritis right so if it's a, a traumatic Uh, traumatic pain then you know it's a mechanical or traumatic so you don't need to do uh, these investigations full blood count crp esr or ultrasound right so if you are unable to localize what joint is affected then it's better to do full blood count esr crp and a blood picture as well right and if the child is less than 8 years old or limp last for less than 7 days uh, you may not do a x-ray because of the less likelihood for perthes disease and then you assess your white cell count if it's if it shows a neutrophilic leukocytosis with elevated crp esr then it's useful to obtain uh, the opinion from the orthopedic team because of the risk of septic arthritis right however if it's very straightforward child present with excruciating pain with very high esr crp and a neutrophilic leukocytosis an ultrasound scan shows evidence of effusion then you can straight away do a orthopedic referral so that they can plan either open arthrotomy or ultrasound guided aspiration <laughs> right and in a child over 8 years where the perthes disease is likely and the hip uh, and the limb or the joint pain lasts for longer than 6 days 7 days then you can consider doing a hip x-ray as well uh, because of the uh, increased prevalence of perthes disease so you have to typically ask for the frog uh, frog uh, frog leg view frog leg lateral view right and if it's if it shows perthes disease or slip capital femoral epiphysis then you have to refer to the orthopedic team for for the management and opinion right uh, however if your x-ray is normal and doesn't show any evidence of perthes or slip capital femoral epiphysis and you don't have any red flags to indicate a different diagnosis then you can consider it as a reactive arthritis and you can arrange a follow up until the child's joint symptoms improve and once the joint symptoms have improved then you can discharge right however <laughs> if the child shows any red flags then you have to do a detailed clinical assessment detailed clinical assessment and then think about this broad differential diagnosis we discussed about and then uh, prioritize your differential diagnosis and then plan plan specific and more focused investigations that are likely to give you the final diagnosis so the take home messages from this presentation so arthritis can be a benign self limiting illness like reactive arthritis however it can indicate a serious more serious illness like septic arthritis or a chronic illness like juvenile idiopathic arthritis or sle and so on so the morbidity mortality is highly variable so it is very important that you arrive at the diagnosis by a thorough clinical evaluation and conditions like septic arthritis kawasaki disease you should not take too much time to diagnose because delaying the diagnosis can have serious consequences septic arthritis the joint can be completely destroyed so kawasaki disease child can have coronary arthritis aneurysms and lifelong cardiac like risk for myocardial infarctions and cardiac complications so it is very important that you think about these conditions and do a timely management 
And what is required is an organized approach, including careful history and physical examination to arrive at the correct diagnosis. And remember, lab evaluation only contributes to 5% of your evaluation. So it's mainly 95% is to our history, focused history and physical examination. Uh, and also, uh, not to forget about certain serious and potentially life-threatening conditions and infections. It can be TB, it can be hematological malignancy uh, that warrant timely diagnosis and appropriate surgical and medical management. Mm -hmm.